Today, we're going to be talking about uh, the, the, the cult of Kibbele, um, which, of course, is the great mother, the magma mater of, of the Anatolia region, right? Uh, she is, uh, her origins uh, can go back to Kato Kuyak or earlier, uh, but at least to the sixth millennium BCE. Uh, the cult of Kibli was rooted uh, in Phrygia, but there are places as well. Uh, of course, Phrygia is interesting. We'll talk more about it. It seems to be the ecstatic heart of Anatolia, and so many mystical, um, almost frenzied religions arrive from this district, and we will investigate that as we go along. Um, you know, everything, of course, from Rumi to the, the Christian Montanists, uh, it is uh, very interesting. So uh, we're going to be uh, going into this belief system uh, in quite a bit of detail. So I want you to hang on. But before we do, uh, let's go into definitions. Everybody uh, always ha ha seems to have discussions on what exactly, how do you say the name? Uh, and everybody is correcting everybody else. I always love that. <laughs> You know, it's kind of like the Aset Isis, Isis, you know, when it comes to the Egyptian goddess, uh, people fight just as much about how to say the name Kibbele. So uh, I'm going to just tell you that people don't change. People back then fought about how to say the name Kibbele. So, 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 so you got to realize that there's not a proper way of saying it. I'm sorry. Uh, there's no purists. They don't exist in this sense. Uh, you could have, of course, uh, Kubeli uh, as one way of saying it, Kubeli. And we find that in the primary sources. Uh, we find also uh, Kubebi. <laughs> I'm serious, Kubebi, because it has two etas. Uh, so uh, it is beta. You have uh, Kubelis is another way to say it, Kubelis uh, in ancient Lydian. Uh, it's Kuvava, <laughs> a great goddess Kuvava. Uh, so, and, and we, we look at, uh, there's a 6th century BCE inscription on a rock face uh, that reads Mater Kubeli, uh, and um, there it is. Uh, later, uh, it will become uh, Kibbele, uh, many groups who arrive in Anatolia, we use the word Kibbele. Uh, even the Turks today will use the word Kibbele. So, sorry, I'm not going to solve that, ad, that question. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to just have to make do with, uh, and that's the reality because uh, it is spelled in different ways in Lydian. It is spelled in different ways in ancient Greek in the inscriptions. So, there are so many variants on, of that. Is, that. is that good? You guys okay with that? All right, now we solved that question. So let's let's keep uh, going. Um, uh, many ancient sources say the name uh, uh, Kubeli or Kibli uh, is related uh, to the idea of mountains, of being born out of a stone, right? And so it seems like she is oftentimes connected with the concept of a holy mountain. Okay, so she is a, a mother goddess. Uh, we find her in various iconography uh, that is consistent over a period of time going all the way back, I mean, quite a ways, ways back, uh, again, uh, to the time of Tatohuya. And how we see here often is a, uh, a seated woman figure uh, who sits prominently on a throne Oftentimes, uh, she has uh, two felines on her hand rests on either side. Uh, this seems to be her accompaniment. So that of a lion or something that is a feline seems to be a consistent theme that goes all the way back. Okay, so all the way back. Uh, Ghibli also is connected uh, to an earlier Anatolian goddess. That is yet another word. You can see the variant of it, uh, known as Kubaba. Kubaba. 
again, going back to the second millennia uh, BCE. Let's just kind of go back to some of the earliest images of her. Okay, so what are the earliest images understood as Kibli, uh, as the mother of gods, uh, is uh, found at a place known as Mount Syphilis. So Mount Syphilis, uh, called Spill Mountain, S-P-I-L, Mountain by the Ancients. Uh, this is a dormant uh, volcano uh, with unusual geographical features. I always find that fascinating that uh, uh, usually holy sacred mountains, there's something that really sets them apart. Uh, something that is unique about how their, their morphology, how they're shaped. And this one uh, is a very unique one. The reason why I'm bringing up this one right away is that this is an ancient image of Kibli that was considered an ancient image by those in ancient times. And that makes it better. <laughs> so you know, these are ancient people saying this is the ancient image. I think that gives them a lot of credibility. What do you think? So, so take a look at this, um, Mount Syphilis, uh, or also known as Spill Mountain, uh, is in the region of Magnesia on the Meander, and I've been here. So uh, this is near the city of Ephesus. It's in the environs of, of Lydia. Kibli uh, was believed to actually occupy uh, this mountain, a, even in an energetic sense, and the region around it. So this is the territory. Uh, of, of, of Kibli, it is interesting. And you're gonna see this is also true when it comes to the city of Ephesus, even though she is a mother goddess and sends to different locations. She does seem to have regions of a special power and occupation where this place is full of her energy, energia. And they, undo, they do understand this as energy. So this is not modern perspectives reading into the information. They do believe that these sites are filled with a special sacred power. We'll go into that in a few moments. And so uh, Mount Spill is one of these locations. Another location, which I will take you to shortly, uh, is Mount Pion at the city of Ephesus, which is dedicated to Kibli which I had a chance to personally investigate uh, in extreme detail. <laughs> and in fact, I've, I've, I've actually uh, spent not only the whole day, but days in this, in this particular mountain. I've even taken naps inside of it. So you're gonna love this. <laughs> if you're my Facebook friend, I actually posted photos of this experience. If you could see it for yourself uh, directly, those are my photos. Anyway. You get some weird dreams, by the way, when you do things like that. All right. <laughs> all those Jungian people are all, yeah, <laughs> let's go there. Okay. All right. Okay. So it is uh, this. Uh, so I'm going to give you a description uh, of Mount Spill from somebody who is describing it in the second century CE. How is that for a primary source? Uh, his name is Pausanias. And he writes as follows. He says, the Magnesians who live to the north of Spill Mount have on the rock Codinus, the most ancient of all the images of the mother of gods. Not for a source, right? But uh, keep going. Uh, the Magnesians say that it was made by Proteus the son of Tantalus, unquote. So this image is supposedly made by uh, the son of Tantalus. Uh, of course, uh, that, was the, that was the ugly son <laughs> uh, uh, of Tantalus by, by Dion, uh, whose, whose sister was Niobe, right? And brother was, oh, look, you're wondering. Unfortunately for old Proteus, um, he was noted for his hubris and when he refused to honor Artemis, uh, the goddess of hunt, uh, she drove him mad and caused himself to be burned alive. <laughs> so, <laughs> great fate for him. But before that happened, 
<laughs> he made this great image of the mother of the gods. So, uh, but you, you see, you do see that there's ions already with the great mother with Artemis, right? And of course, obviously, Kibbele. Uh, the image was rediscovered in 1881 by W.M. Ramsey, uh, a wonderful archaeologist. Um, it's um, the image does date back to the second millennium BCE, so it is pretty old. Uh, it is sculpted out of the solid rock uh, by, and it's 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 they say it's the Hittites. A lot will say a lot of people will say actually it's the Luvians but uh, using Hittite letters. It's very eroded. The head is partly missing, uh, but the image is indeed of an enthroned goddess. She is sitting on a throne, and there is the attendant lion on each side of her arms, you know, uh, which, it, which is really fascinating because if you see this image, it parallels in many ways the image of the seated goddess Achatohuyak. It is as if time had not gone by. Thousands of years have not gone by, and all of a sudden we see this static image that continued to stay the same in much of its iconography. Again, for me, that is absolutely fascinating. It really is. You know, it shows the traditionalism is pretty well entrenched when it comes to this goddess, right? Um, she is also, in a very ancient way, going back uh, to at least 8,000 BCE, she is uh, depicted as holding her breasts in both of her hands. Isn't that fascinating? And this is the second millennium, and yet they have been doing this for thousands of years before this, and it still is retaining that same aspect. Uh, of course, uh, we see this throughout uh, Neolithic images, right? The figure is approximately um, about eight meters high from the recess of the cliff, so it is large. There are four Hittite hieroglyphs located at the squared section uh, on the right-hand side. And so there it is. The Turks call this place stone figure. Um, and um, yeah, and so this is is an important site. By the way, Pausanias mentions that there's other cool places in this area, including the throne of Pelop, uh, as well as the tomb of Tantalus. <laughs> so you can see this. There's a whole bunch of, of legends and lore uh, connected to Tantalus uh, that would be fun to investigate at some point, because there are some legendary mystical materials that most people don't know about, perhaps another time. All right, moving right along. Of course, um, across much of the Phrygian highlands, uh, you have a whole bunch of these monumental rock cut images. And they're often in the form of doorways. They are many of them are connected to Kibbele. Uh, these are sacred thresholds. These are boundaries between this world and the supernatural. What I find is fascinating is is that uh, they literally cut a door to the other world. It is understood as a portal, and it allows for the goddess to peek out, to show herself, looking out through what are oftentimes described as an epiphany window. And so you, in a sense, have a chance to, through ritual, ritual action, be able to uh, approach the goddess directly, and she moves through it. You're going like a window. Now you're thinking, well, this is this is interesting. Can you go further with this, Dr. Rickfeld? You can, and I will. This is the background that will go into Christianity behind the idea of the icon. <laughs> now you're going, oh, now we get it. Does that make sense, right? It is this window, it's this doorway uh, just like you have with the Eastern Orthodox saints, right? You know, you have access, direct access with the energy. You don't, you don't capture the saint, but you connect to its energy uh, through prayer. Well, that's exactly what they've been doing in Phrygia uh, and Anatolia long before that. And Christianity has actually enveloped this practice, especially Eastern Christianity. That's why they have to be, the icons have to be flat. 
this making sense? Is you making connections? All right, we'll keep on going. Okay, uh, moving right along, there are some other figures, although I think I've unpacked a lot of things already. Uh, oh, one other thing is the Epiphany windows. I've seen so many of them. Uh, they will eventually make the Epiphany windows placed on people's tombs, and also will put them on top of temples. The Temple of Artemis will have an Epiphany window, it harkens back to this period of time, ancient Egypt. We also have what are called the Banyader uh, figures. The Banyader, B A Y A N D I R, Banyader, connected to the cult of the Magna Mater in Phrygia. They date around the late 8th to the early 7th century BCE. One, of course, uh, of these, uh, for example, is an ivory figurine. It was a goddess holding two children wearing her characteristic dress. What is most curious is that there's another silver figure showing somebody wearing the same clothing as the goddess, but is missing both breasts and female hips. And so it is apparently male from this period. So you have, in a sense, from the late 8th to the 7th century, evidence of what will become known as the Gali. Uh, these are the male priests of, of, um, of Kibli, who in a sense become the female priestesses of Kibli. And so they're already shown that early in images uh, showing female dress. Uh, this, uh, this or male uh, figure, lacks a beard, has a rather elaborate hairstyle and long ringlets in front of the ears, but it's shaved and back. Um, in fact, we find many of these beardless uh, figurines of these sacred attendants uh, throughout Anatolia. Uh, and again, once again, it seems to be uh, the Dallas. Okay? So we'll be talking more about these uh, priests, or I should say priestesses, and we're going to dive deep into the controversy. Oh, don't worry. We are going to go there. I'm not going to just kind of walk on by and say, okay, we're not going to talk about this. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, so we'll go into the idea of, of, of gender and so forth when it comes to their understanding. And the beauty of it is, I'm going to use their own words. How's that? <laughs> That's, and I think it's always best to hear from them. You know, so often scholars talk amongst themselves. And it's like, well, why don't we just ask them? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we have we come up with all these wonderful formulas and ideas and so forth. I'm going, we can do better than that. All right, from the place called Eatnik, uh, we find a sculptural relief from, of Proto Kibli uh, that is next to a composite figure that is part human and part lion. Uh, it has kind of Neo-Hittite influences. Uh, this uh, Shemira uh, holds a winged sun. Uh, and um, oftentimes, uh, again, you have a lot of this idea where the Neo-Hittite influence does seem to uh, connect to Kibli, but it's still not the source information. Now, Phrygia still is the center of Kibli worship. That's why sometimes they call her the Phrygian mountain mother, right? Because uh, she is connected to Phrygia. Okay, so archaeology has revealed a lot uh, connected to Kibli uh, in connection to Phrygia, uh, especially like Midas City in Western Phrygia. Uh, and of course, it's named uh, connected to the King Midas. You know, the guy with the golden touch. You know that one? Yeah, well, did he exist? Of course he existed. I, you know, yeah, I've been to his tomb. Although it's, it's interesting because it's almost a tomb. Um, you go deep in, and the wood inside the tomb is so old, it's petrified. <laughs> but it's there. It is for sure King Midas. But I got some bad news. I didn't find anything made out of gold there. <laughs> so he apparently lost the touch. <laughs> okay, I gotta stop. All right, but anyway, so uh, King Midas, uh, his name 
Midas and inscriptions. Oh, you weren't joking. You, there really was a King Midas. Yes, there was. Uh, his name in inscriptions uh, appear in many religious graffiti, and uh, that is dedicated to the goddess Matar, which, of course, obviously is uh, is uh, the great mother goddess. It is it is Ghibli, as we find in other inscriptions. So Midas, in fact, in many cases, uh, you're going to have Midas uh, as the uh, uh, as the uh, as the son uh, of Ghibli in certain stories. Wow, yeah, well, that kind of changes things a little bit. We also find, of course, uh, beyond the graffiti, we find monumental uh, images connected to Ghibli, uh, cult reliefs, stepped altars, and stone facades. Uh, oftentimes we find the, the, the goddess uh, connected to two human figures side by side uh, who are neither fully male or female. Uh, again, images of Gali, you know, early on. So we do know that this practice uh, of a, a transitioned uh, priesthood from male to female existed a long ways back, uh, back uh, again, uh, going back to at least uh, the 700s, 600s BCE. And another site uh, known as Gordian, this is, this is the place where I, where I have visited King Midas's tomb, the Tomos, the burial place is still there. Uh, again, we find many images of beardless men, young men being found who are attendants of this goddess. So I know we're going to go into some of the other uh, information regarding uh, primary sources, but I want you to see some of the archaeological evidence. I want to get there a little bit. Not only what people are writing down, it's something that we find within uh, the material culture, right? Now, let's kind of move now into uh, more of a conversational aspect. Now, this mother goddess uh, is understood to be Kibbele, and he, she is also related uh, to the Minoans. What? Because remember that the Minoans are not only based in Crete uh, and the surrounding islands of, a of Asia, but uh, the Minoans actually occupied, and know that directly, the coast of Anatolia. I was there at Ephesus in 2008 when Sabine Lodstadter and the other archaeologists uncovered the Minoan uh, ruins at the foot of Aya Saluk Hill. I can tell you firsthand the Minoans were there in Ephesus. I've seen uh, the Minoan vessels at Miletus. Uh, they were there too. In fact, all along, I know ones were there. And so their beliefs mix with the indigenous peoples who are known as the Luvians, uh, who are an offshoot of the Hittites. And uh, Luvian uh, peoples include the Carians and Lelegates, the Samians, right? <laughs> Lots of words. I'm sorry, word salad. But there you have it. Okay, so we know. So the Minoans do have a connection with her. Uh, in Crete itself, then, uh, the, she is connected to the goddess known as Rhea. But Kibli is also connected to the goddess Rhea uh, in the area of the Troad, around Troy. She is, so she is not just Kibli, she is Rhea and understood as that. How do we know? We find inscriptions. That will show the name Kibbele, but the name Rhea. <laughs> they are connected. I'm going to go further. In many cases, when they make these connections, they'll even put the names directly together as part of the name. <laughs> so it's hard to doubt that. So they are connected. Uh, we also have connections between Rhea uh, and the underworld aspect of Kibbele because she's connected to the underworld, this world, and the sky, oftentimes the mountain viewed as a transitional period between these three levels, she is connected to another goddess that's imported in. You guys ever heard of Hecate? <laughs> there you have it. And so Hecate will be connected. So we will find even inscriptions that will say Rhea Hecate. <laughs> so 
Uh, and we're going to go into that because that goes directly into Mount Pion in Ephesus, which we'll talk about, which is connected to uh, Kibli, Artemis, and Hecate at the same time. And they have uh, altars dedicated to all of them, understood as one. Okay. Now, moving right along, although I know we're moving slowly, I think this is good because I want you to really understand these ideas, right? Okay, so okay, so later on, uh, the Minoans and their idea of Rhea will transfer over to Mycenaean. These are the actual Greeks. Minoans are not Greek, but Mycenaeans are. We find this name, um, uh, aspects are connected to nature. Uh, and then, of course, moving right on through. In general, let's talk about another topic because I'm bringing in all the layers. Let's talk about uh, Thrace. Now, from Thrace, uh, there is another connection. Uh, okay, so in general, those from Thrace understood that the main divinity of Samothrace, which is an island, and uh, are connected to a goddess by the name of Rhea Hecate. When the Thracians settled in Asia Minor, and they became acquainted with Kibli, they made the association with their own Rhea Hecate, I'm giving you some details here, especially in the ecstatic form of religion connecting to them both. This later created a precedent for when the Greeks later settled along the coast of Asia Minor, equating Rhea with Kibli, but also Hecate. <laughs> you guys got that. <laughs> So uh, there you have it, you know, so you're going to see that. Who, give me a source. How about Strabo, uh, section 471? How about the Homeric hymn, uh, 1331? Okay, gave you sources. So there you have it. Furthermore, Reyes as Kibli was also said to have taught the god Dionysus, the mystery uh, of, of course, not just the wine, the other mysteries, and purified them in Phrygia. So through these same sources, you're going to you have Dionysus, the Dionysian cult, will be connected. Who says that? Apollodorus, chapter 3, 5, and 1. Okay. <laughs> wow. Oh, so, of course, uh, it makes sense now, right? How these, these are all kind of connected together, this ecstatic, wild religion, right, that seems to move beyond the boundaries. We'll go there in a few moments there, too. Uh, now. Placing the ecstatic religions of the Dionysian mysteries without, with that of Kibli would be natural, uh, it, it, since that both of them focused on the unbridled power of nature that is essentially untamable. I'm going to quote Strabo to you concerning this. Strabo, of course, uh, lived in the first century BCE, the first century CE. And I'm just going to read what he wrote. So you'll have this as a source. Uh, he, and this is the passage concerning the orgies of Dionysus that are said to be derived from those of Mater Theon Kibli. He says that when Pindaurus, that's a Greek poet, uh, in the Dithrom, which begins with these words, uh, he's quoting somebody else, I'm quoting him, he's quoting somebody else. In earlier times, there marched the lay of the Dithrams long drawn out mentions the hymn sung in honor of Dionysus, both the ancient and the later ones. And then passing on from these says, to perform the prelude in thy honor, Megala Mater, great mother, the whirling of symbols is at hand. And among them also, the clanging of castanets and the torch that blazeth beneath the tawny pine trees. He bears witness to the common relationship between the rites exhibited in the worship of Dionysus amongst the Greeks and those in the worship of the Mater Theon amongst the Phrygians, for it makes these rites closely akin to one another. I'm actually still quoting him. <laughs> and Euripides does likewise in his Bacchae, citing the Lydian usages at the same time with those of Phrygia uh, because of their similarity. But ye who lift Mount Tumlos, fortress of Lydia, rebel band of mine, Dionysian women, 
whom I brought from the land of the barbarians as my assistants and traveling companions, of lift the tambourines made into Phrygian cities, invention of mine and Mother Rhea. And again, happy he who is, blessed man, initiated into the mystic rites, is pure in his life. Then there's a, there's a, there's a break in the text, lacuna, right? Who preserving the righteous orgia or orgies of the great mother Kibli and brandishing the thyrus and high and reed with ivy doth worship Dionysus. Come ye Bacchae, come ye Bacchae, bringing down Bromios, God the child of God, out of the Phrygia mountains into the broad highways of Greece. I mean, there's so much to unpack here. <laughs> You know, but you can see right here, there is a connection. This is a short passage with Kibli, with the goddess Rhea. You see it? You saw also in this passage with the god Dionysus and exactly how through the orgia, through the orgastic feasts, right? And through the celebrations and the connection with the idea of a holy mountain. <laughs> it's like, Thank you, thank you so much. You know, um, I gotta tell you, Strabo really makes things easy because <laughs> he just kind of just he just said it all right there. So I, I always love this because you know scholars would debate back and forth, and often I go, "Have you guys ever read Strabo before?" <laughs> like, no, no. We'll read that and let's 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 actually start from there, and then do the investigation, because I always think. That we should start where people were at that time of understanding their own beliefs. I'm an anthropologist at heart. I think we should understand the world according to them and then move to interpret it to us. Does that make sense? Get into the mysteries, become part of it, and then try to understand it from the inside out. And that's what I'm doing right here. And that's what I'm doing for you guys today. So, giving you, there's a lot of scholars will just go ahead, you know, Strabo, and just, they'll say what he said. I want to, I want you guys to hear what he said. So you have that. If you're not quoting me, you're quoting Strabo. Is that good? Right? Okay, a little bit more. Yeah, he's still talking. <laughs> yeah, he's long winded like me. So uh, he goes on, and again, the triple crested corbants in the cavern invented. This hide stretch circlet, which is the tambourine. So he's talking about the uh, Cori bonds. These are the attendants of Rhea. They are also the attendants of Kibli. They're, they're one and the same. And they're involved in revelry. You see another theme, which is a big one, and that is caves. The cave is also very important uh, to Kibli. And you're seeing, of course, the reference to the creation of the tambourine. And blent its bakery, excuse me, with a high pitched, sweet sounding breath of Phrygian flutes. There you have the Phrygian flutes. And in Rhea's hands, placing its resounding noise to accompany the shouts of the Bacchae. And from Mater, Rhea frenzied the satires, who obtained it and joined to the choral dances of the Triridides, in whom Dionysus takes belief. So um, just one quote alone. I just even added now the mystique of the caves, uh, the accompaniment of the flute, uh, the tambourines, the musical accompaniment that connects to the Ghibli. So I want you to understand now the Dionysian rites, the rites of Ghibli are, are, are joined together. They're part of the exotica of Anatolia. Is this helpful? Kind of going through this? Okay. Let's go, keep going. Eventually, uh, some Greeks began to believe that the worship of Kibli came from the Greeks. You know, this happens a lot. The Greeks do this. They go, we like this so much, and we like ourselves even more. So whatever is really cool, we must have come up with it. And so that's what happens a lot uh, in ancient history. Uh, I'll tell you a secret. They didn't come up with it. <laughs> in fact, they come up with a lot of things that they claim, uh, especially the mythology. Uh, very little of the 12 Olympians are actually from the Greeks. A little. We, after, after class, we can go through each one, and I'm going to tell you where they all really come from. 
not a great story. Uh, but there you have it. Still, they really do seem to improve certain things at Pilots. But uh, anyway, Diodorus Siculus, he speculated that the worship of Kibli actually came from Samothrace. Uh, and uh, it's supposed, uh, it's, it just goes into the, the son of Zeus and Electra were connected to that. And I'm not going to even go there. It's not going to give you my time. So I'll tell you, you're going to run into sources where they'll say, you know, we came up with it. I just want you to, to know he they didn't. Okay. But they keep going back uh, to the um, uh, to the idea of, of Thrace and, and, and Samothrace. So, all right, did I, did I freeze for a second? Okay, I froze for a second. So my mind is okay. Uh, but there you have it. Uh, classicists have recognized uh, similarities between the culture of Ephesus uh, and Samothrace, however. Uh, which is a, a connection there. So but let's keep on going because we're, I don't want to go down that rabbit trail. Uh, let's talk about uh, the Corbants or Corbantic uh, worship. The uh, the attendants of of Kibli of, of Rhea, uh They are oftentimes known as the Curates also known as the Corribantes, right? Uh, and uh, we find them in connection to both the Phrygian version and as well as the Cretan Rhea. And of course, there's a connection between these Curates uh, and these Corribantes with another group known as the Idaean Dactyles. Okay, the Idaean Dactyles. Don't worry, I'm gonna unpack every one of these words. <laughs> But uh, there you have it. These are the attendants. Um, and in their respective uh, sense, they are oftentimes also of a frenzied demeanor. Uh, the two set of attendants were connected to the Gali priesthood, at least uh, in a mythological sense, uh, known for their warlike cries, uh, their violent movements, and their armor. And we see this, uh, in fact, connected to uh, other uh, oftentimes uh, female attendants that wear armor, that are warrior-like, that uh, uh, connect to another group known as the Amazons. Uh, maybe you've heard of these before, uh, doing their war dance before the image of, of Artemis of the Ephesians. Well, we have to go back. And we're going to go back to another topic that is connected to Kibli and to Rhea. Here we go. You ready for some mystery that most people don't know about? Here we go. Once upon a time, there was a mount known as Mount Ida. I-D-A. Mount Ida, very interesting. Uh, if we take a look linguistically, uh, at the word Ida. Let's look at it. Let's be careful, right? Ida is a root for the word earth. So Ida means, Ida means earth. So when I talk about Mount Ida, I'm talking about Mount Earth. So that, that help? Now, it turns out that there's not one Mount Ida. There's two Mount Idas, both uh, venerated today. There is one on the island of Crete in the very middle that was sacred to the Minoans. And there's another that's located overlooking the city of Troy <laughs> that was sacred to the ancient Luvians, Mount Ida. They were both dedicated to the goddess Rhea. Ida one and Ida two. <laughs> uh, and they have attendants that are connected to them. The first attendants for both of those Idas were known as the Idaean Dactyles, hence Idaean Ida Dactyles. You guys got this so far? All right. We're not done yet. The, uh, when it comes to, let's go a little bit further. Obviously, Ida uh, is also Ida. 
Uh, it is also da. Uh, it is also da. It is also ga. It is also ga. All means earth. Got it? You get following now. So if you put mater, of course, means mother. Mater, mater. Of course, later on we have like muter, you know, mother, right? And, you know, because it's it's Indo-European language, right? So what, what oftentimes the goddess of these both these mountains were Ida Mater. Ida Mater. And of course, if you're doing the translation, that's Earth Mother. So both mountains are the Earth Mother. A little bit more trivia. Uh, in the ancient, going back, uh, you have a Minoan root for a spouse, which is pos. Pos, spouse that goes into Greek later on. And so the spouse of the Earth was Poseidon. <laughs> and so that was originally the consort of the great mother. Is this cool so far? Now Poseidon makes a lot more sense. Yeah, because he was the, just the spouse of the earth. And he's the one, of course, who, and so he's the one who, in a sense, impregnated the mount. Later on, there'll be a switcheroo, and they'll replace Poseidon with Zeus. And it'll be Zeus that connects to it. And then, of course, you have these other connections as Zeus becomes not the one who is fertilizing the mount, but he becomes the one that is sheltered uh, in the mount, uh, being the son of, of, of Rand. Does that make sense? And, of course, you know, obviously, even on a story. So are you guys following so far? Is this making sense? You guys are, you guys are following? You know, there's a gradual transition. This is part of the mysteries, right? Okay, so here he goes. According to Pausanias, right, uh, the Idean dactyles, known as the dactyloi of Ida, were given charge to uh, uh, protect the baby Zeus uh, from the devouring father Canus after Rhea gave birth to them below Mount Ida in Crete. You guys got it? The idea in Bactiles, they were magical creatures, magical creatures who are not only agents of magic, but of metalworking as well. Uh, in fact, they came up with the invention of iron. So they're forgers because iron was viewed as this magical alchemical process, after all, which eventually gave those in the Iron Age an advantage. Uh, and of course, it came from this region, and of course, obviously, the Luvians as well. So here we go. Uh, so the idea of Dactyles, uh, they live along the lower regions of Mount Ida. Uh, this mountain was believed, both Mount Ida uh, located uh, in, uh, in Crete, but also Mount Ida located uh, in, um, in the Troad. And by the way, as it's located on the Troad, it's on the border of another area known as Phrygia. Hey, it's the border. Oh, yeah, the Phrygian. Are you guys seeing these connections? So you got these dual mountains on both sides. Once again, you're hearing things that most people will never talk about. So, hey, you're learning new things here. So, uh, anyway, uh, Mount Ida. Now, remember, mountains were viewed as uh, these, these, these highways uh, between the, the realm of the sky the realm of the earth and the underworld, right? And so uh, what happened is, is that the supposed cave that sheltered Zeus uh, was supposedly located along the Mount Ida uh, that was in, in, um, in Crete, uh, although um, there's lots of possible locations. But all, going further, just to make things more complicated, because I like doing that, uh, the Mount Ida, uh, in uh, in uh, the Troad, which is on the border between the Troad and Phrygia, it was sacred, of course, to Kimberly. We know that from uh, writings and inscriptions, and we'll actually go over some of those today. We know that it's, it's connected also uh, to Rhea, but it's also connected to another goddess known as Adrastia. <laughs> oh, Adrastia, uh, who basically is just another name for Rhea and Kimberly. So. 
there, you name it. So, okay, moving along. Uh, the idea of back tiles uh, were said to be the first settlers along the lower slopes of Mount Ida. Uh, of course, uh, four of the lower slopes of the mountain are called feet. Uh, and so the back tiles are like the fingers <laughs> of the mountain. Hello, back tiles. You guys are following that too, right? Accordingly, uh, they uh, you basically have uh, forms of the back tiles. We have uh, Domenius is one of the name of, of, of the back tiles. Uh, Kelamis is another one. You guys ever heard of Hercules and Akbon and a few others? So there you are. Some will say that they were not just attendants, they were wizards as well. And that they are, according to many sources, the one who gave birth to both the Curates and the Corbantes, who are also attendants of the goddess. There you go. Okay. I wish I could go further into that, but that's a whole nother lecture in and of itself. But uh, you can see now, you got these Idas. And you have the Minoan, Minoan and Luvian, the same period of time. Uh, you have the combination between Rhea, uh, Kibli, and you're going to get obviously Ikate in with the in with the uh, Rhea connection. Uh, and you can see geographically uh, how it's moving towards Phrygia. You not see it? That's right. It's, so it's kind of moving to the border. So let's go to the next step, and that's to the center place of the worship of Kibli. And the next center place is known as Pacinius. 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 Now, the site of Pacinius, uh, it's in Phrygia. Uh, here, she is worshipped in the form of a black meteorite stone, uh, and, but it was originally connected to a mountain goddess. Uh, and, and of course, that mountain goddess is known as Agdistus, and we'll go there. In fact, the name Pisinus means the castle where the fall has taken place. So, so, so it turns out that this is the sky aspect of this goddess that comes that comes falling like a like a meteorite. The site of Pisinus is situated on the upper part of the Sartaris River known as what's called the Sangreas River, you know, the bloody river, right? Uh, yet, uh, and it's also, of course, connected to the same territory where Midas is. Unfortunately, archaeology can only go back to 400 BCE, uh, so we're waiting to find a, er, an earlier site for Pisinius and the local legends. According to Strabo, the priests of Pisinius uh, had been there since what he calls ancient times, so a long time ago. Uh, and connected to uh, King Midas. But how was Kibli originally worshipped? Many scholars uh, believe that the Phrygians provide some key uh, elements uh, in that. Now, as far as the designation mater, the word in Phrygian means, mater means, it can mean mother, hold your breath, it could also mean mediator. Uh-huh, I'm serious, in Phrygian. So it means mother and mediator. And so she was the goddess of boundaries, standing at the threshold between the tamed and the untamed, the civilized and the uncivilized, as well as the realm of the living and the dead. And while she had the ability to soothe wild creation, she herself was still intrinsically an aspect of this unspoiled natural state. So she's connected to lions and hawks and, and mountains, right? Kibli uh, was proclaimed the mistress of animals, much like you see this with the Minoans, their goddess that goes down to the Mycenaeans, we know through Linear B, is mistress of the animals. We also know, of course, Artemis is a mistress of the animals, right? And later Greeks, of course, know this as Otnia Theron, right? Kibli was appealed to Paul, 
her, her, her natural ferocity, right? For the benefit of humanity. You see, nature is wild, right? It's out of control. It's chaotic. And who's the center of this chaos? Kibble is. She's wild, right? But because she is the center of the hurricane, as a hurricane, she can also calm herself down. She has that power. As long as you let her still be her primal aspect. Is that making sense? So she can make things good for you when it comes to planting and the weather and procreation. But you got to make sure that she stays wild. Everything about her is still to be respected. So if successful in dealing with Kibbley, uh, she can protect towns and cities from natural threats and offering her natural blessings, as I said, like fertility, as long as it was respected that she herself would require, here it is, here's a big caveat, a more natural form of worship. A worship that went back in many forms through the millennia. And so she would be depicted as wearing a mural crown, displaying city gates and walls, and often the city itself. But at the same time, uh, it is through her natural and bridal power that she would protect it. Right? And the expectation is, is that while she will give civilized benefits, your religious devotion to her is still to be wild. It's still to be unbridled. It's still to be frenzied. As long as you understood that as the exchange and relationship, you're okay. You guys got that? You know, so so that means is that if you are a worshiper of her, when you enter into her space, you respect her rules, and that is the rules of the wild realm. And that's why her belief system uh, is so often controversial, right? The artistic rituals and you know <laughs> lots of things going on there, right? <laughs> that's because that's the expectation. You know, that's part of the agreement. Uh, as we discussed, Kibli was connected to sacred mountains and was herself viewed as a mountain goddess. More than that, Kibli was connected to sacred springs and underground water sources. In fact, her places of worship were inclusive of both mountains and springs and holy caves. In form and costume, the Phrygians adopted uh, the, the outfit of the Neil uh, Hittite goddess Kibli. As I said before, the boundaries of life and death is, uh, is the, the most natural of all. And of course, uh, so Kibli was appealed, uh, was appealed to for protection on various tombs as well as Addis, especially in Asia Minor, and mostly in the environs of, of Phrygia. So there you have it. So tombs are often viewed as dwelling places where the spirit potentially resided. So in this sense, Kibli was invoked to protect one's new home. And architectural features often accompanied these tomb homes to further the connection. So Kibli, so you'll find people uh, having on their tombs an epiphany window of Kibli. And she is there, right? And she is there in a sense, uh, guarding the boundary between life and death. Okay, uh, the, the, the Phrygian, Lydian, and other nobles from northern Anatolia began to appeal to Kibli, uh, not only to make their cities more civilized <laughs> and, and their, their, their uh, uh, crops more plentiful and procreation, but you know, the wild world of politics, that certainly was chaotic then as well as now. And so they appeal to her to help out with that too. And so Midas, uh, the king of Phrygia, uh, founded a temple dedicated to her and sponsored her cult so that, you know, that in return, she could make the way straight for his rule. Uh, she became his special protector in the end and consort in the afterlife, almost like he's a becomes a semi uh, divinity. Uh, and as I said before, according to pseudo hygienist Midas was actually the son of the goddess. So there you have it. Uh, Kibli, as I said, had this natural wildness, 
Uh, and so ecstatic experiences were connected with her worship. And it was expected to be shared by those who are members of the same cult. Libations of blood were also expected with Phrygian shaft monuments uh, to accommodate these baths of blood still, still in the stone. <laughs> you can find. So, yeah, lots of blood to be shed. Obviously, not only the baths of blood, but the uh, obviously, it seems to be related to Parabolium later on. So there seems to be blood rituals involved here. Now, central to the uh, veneration of the great Anatolian mother goddess, especially in Phrygia, uh, is the story of the goddess and the boy by the name of Atlas. Accordingly, the goddess, Kibli, inspired the first music accompanied by pipes and drums, and was a great healer. And her magical powers were able to heal the sick, especially children and animals. And in one version of the story, there are many versions, I'm going to give you the long version in a few moments. In many, in some of the versions of the story, uh, she fell in love with the prince, Athos. It's a love story that would end in tragedy. In fact, in one version of the story, Athos fell so deeply in love that he became obsessed with the divine lady to the point of insanity, castrated himself and died. Kibli, deranged and lost in despair, traveled about the countryside in search of her lost love. Okay. So there you have it. So, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you the long version. So here we go. The water. <laughs> I guess it's a warm day. <sighs> you guys ready? There we go. Once upon a time. <laughs> so I'm going to give you my source. His name is Arnobius. Uh, he lived in the 4th century CE. But uh, he is quoting many parts from another uh, writer by the name of Timotheus. Uh, and the story was told of her at the cities. And the story goes as follows. Once upon a time. And oh, I, I got to tell you ahead of time. This is not going to be the typical happy story. But don't expect it to be. Okay, just be forewarned. Okay. So, all right. You think I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating? Wait till I tell you the story. Okay. Uh, once upon a time in Phrygia, uh, there was Agdos. Agdos was the great mound where Deucalion and, and Phyra, uh, after the great flood, they landed on top of this mountain. And they picked up the stones to throw behind their backs in order to reestablish the human race. And so, of course, obviously, uh, they, you know, the stones that were thrown behind Deucalion became men. The, thrones, the stones thrown behind Fira became women. And that's how the earth was repopulated. So whatever you do, don't throw stones. They'd be giving birth to a whole new generation. All right. So what happens is uh, this great stone was infused with the vitality of the great mother goddess. It was, in essence, her in stone form. And here comes Zeus, which before was most likely Poseidon. You guys got it? Here comes Zeus, being Zeus, who attempted to seduce uh, the great mother and manages to have relations with a great stone goddess, impregnating the stone. Stonewalling. Anyway, soon uh, the, the holy mound became pregnant, and Agdistus is born of the strange union. Agdistus is a, not neither a he nor a she, it's a bisexual child, uh, neither male nor female, but was filled with rage against mortals and immortals alike. In fact, uh, in fact, it became worrisome to the point where Dionysus decides he needs to do something about this. So he gets uh, this uh, Hermaphrodite drunk, and as Hermaphrodite uh, is, falls asleep into a stupor, Dionysus then, the god of wine, of course, uh, ties his male member to his feet. And so when Agdestus wakes up, he 
the man's himself with that part emasculates himself and the flow of blood pours from this wound where the male member used to be is a hermaphrodite so he has both uh, and from this blood a pomegranate tree is born okay uh, it's interesting as a result this, this is now perceived as theoretical female uh, by default of the loss of the member uh, so there you have it um, so then now, once upon a time, there was a certain Nana, uh, the daughter of a king by the name of San Andreas, uh, who was enraptured by the sight of the pomegranate tree and desired to have just one. So she, what she did is she picked one of the pomegranates. You got to watch out for pomegranates. I got to tell you that. No, right? Just talk to Persephone. <laughs> yeah, it's like wow. Yeah. So I have some pomegranate juice here. Maybe I'll have some afterwards. See what happens. But uh, what happens is that she sees this pomegranate. It is desirous in her sight. Decided to uh, pick it from the tree and place it upon her bosom, and that's what makes her pregnant. Just by placing the pomegranate on her bosom, makes you think twice, right? <laughs> uh, and of course. Uh, uh, Pausanias even talks about this uh, beyond Arnobius. Uh, he writes, there grew up of from it the blood of Megistus, an almond tree with the fruit ripe, and a daughter of the river Sagreus, they say, took the fruit, laid it on her bosom when it was once disappeared, but she was with child. What I read that is, is that apparently the pomegranate went into her breast. <laughs> Just got... <laughs> so... <laughs> okay. Okay, sorry, I'm the only one laughing here, but it's just so interesting. Um, uh, in reaction to her pregnancy, her father locked her away, intending her to starve to death. Hibley did not permit Nana to die, and so fed her through her magical ways. And Nana gave birth, and gave birth, uh, and, but the king was horrified, uh, and the king took the child away from her, and ordered the infant to be exposed to the wild, left to die. This was the baby Actus. Pausanias continues, a boy was born and exposed, but was tended by a he-goat, and he grew up, and his beauty was more than human, and Agdestus fell in love with him. Wait, what? <laughs> so here is now Attis. He's extremely handsome. Remember Agdestus, who was once a hermaphrodite, but now is a female, who is born of Agdos, which, which is the which is the rock of Kibli. You guys keeping track of all this, right? Well, now uh, she falls in love with him. Okay, uh, and so according to Anorbius, um, um, you know they 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 their, their love went back. And Kimberly also loved Attis, and, and she also loved Agdestus, and they all loved each other. So we got this love triangle. <laughs> Everybody's loving each other. You know, there needs to be more love to go around. So this is interesting, right? So meanwhile, you have King Midas of Piscinius, uh, and he tried to convince Attis to forsake Agdestus and take the hand of his daughter in marriage because his daughter now fell in love <laughs> with the handsome Attis. Okay, so he wants he wants Attis. Attis agreed. So King Midas, Midas set up a day of the great wedding with his daughter. Uh, he locked up the city walls so no one would be able to uh, disturb the ceremony. But Kimberly was pretty upset, let alone Agdestus. So what happens is that Kimberly, knowing the destiny of the youth and that he would never be safe among men unless he could escape the bonds of marriage, unquote, he basically threw herself headfirst against the walls of Zinnius, quote, which from then on and for this reason was crowned with towers, unquote. Now, Agdestus was not far behind, and she broke up the ceremony too, 
uh, and through her powers imparted insane rage upon the attendants, making the bride cut off her breasts and King Midas to unman himself. All right. So this is not exactly the best wedding. So, um, so uh, meanwhile, Addis uh, uh, fell into this trance-like state. He runs out into the wilderness and he cuts off his male member. And then he falls at the base of a pine tree while exclaiming, Here, Egdestus, take those parts because of which you have caused such great tragedies through madness. So, all right, uh, Ovid, uh, in his Fasti, uh, writes as follows. He gives a lot of more information. I want you to hear this. I'm, again, I want you to hear their perspective of things. He says, what causes the impulse of Kibli's initiates to self-castrate? I was silent. The muse began. A woodland Phrygian boy, the gorgeous Athos, conquered the towered goddess with pure love. She wanted to keep him as her shrine's guardian and said, desire to be my boy always. He promised what was asked and he declared, if I lie, let the Venus I cheat to be my last. You never say things like that. You never make those kinds of oaths. What happens? Oh, continues. He cheats. <laughs> uh, and in the nymph, Sagarius stops being what he was. The goddess's wrath punished him. She slashes the tree and cuts the naiads down. The naiad dies. Her fate was the trees. He goes mad and imagines that the bedroom roof is falling and bolts to Didymus's height. So basically, we get a little bit more story when it comes to the marriage. Apparently, the ceremony had finished, and he had actually gone in to consummate the marriage in the bedroom when all of this is unleashed. And then he goes crazy in the bedroom and runs off in front of the top of the mountain. So that's what happens. And he cries, away torches, away whips, and often swears the Palestine bodices gave him. He even hacked his body with a jagged stone and dragged his long hair in squalid dirt, shouting, I deserved it. My blood is the penalty. Ah, death to the parts which have ruined me. Ah, death to them, he said, and cropped his groin's weight. Suddenly no signs of manhood remained. His madness became a model. Soft skin, alkalites, tossed their hair and cut their worthless organs, unquote. I'm actually answering a lot of questions too. There's a question, uh, it goes a lot about whether they just remove the testicles or they remove everything, uh, you're going to find after you go through all these sources that it's everything for most of the, most of the situations. And so that's a lot of blood, you know, and that's dangerous. I'm sure many who went into these rituals died uh, because of that. And they actually sewed something on top to try to heal the wound, but we'll go to that later. Is this interesting? Do you guys learn anything? All right, Arnobius uh, concludes that with the streaming blood, his life flies, but the great mother of the gods gathers the parts which have been cut off and throws earth on them, having first covered them and wrapped them in the garment of the dead. From the blood springs a flower of violet, and the tree is surrounded with flowers. Hence, this is the origin of the custom, whereby you even now veil and wreath the sacred pine with flowers. According to Arnobius, the mother of the gods shed tears also from which springs an almond tree, signifying the bitterness of death. Then she bears away to her cave. There's a cave, the pine tree, which is obviously a phallic symbol, the pine tree, right? Beneath which Addis had unmasked, uh, sorry, unmanned himself. And Agdestus, joining in her wailings, she beats and wounds her breasts pacing around the trunk of the tree, now at rest. Jupiter is begged by Agdestus that Athos may be restored to life. He does, he does not permit it. What, however, fate allows, he readily, readily grants, that his body should not decay, that his hair should always grow, and that the least of his fingers should live 
and should be kept ever in motion, content with which favors. It is said that Augustus consecrated the body in Pisinius and honored it with yearly rites and precisely sacrifices. You guys got it? You already I've explained so much of Kibli and the cult using the words from ancient times. Now you know where these rituals, you go, wait a minute, Dr. Rico, the Dali make more sense already because they're at us. <sighs> Bingo. That's right. Right? They're attendants. Yes. But let's go. You know, then there's other stories which I don't want to go into, but um, because yes, in some versions of the story, uh, he does survive. And he has kind of an eventful life afterwards. In fact, uh, according to one tradition, Addis survives his ordeal and becomes the constant attendant of Kibli. And, and, um, and there's one story where he visits Dionysus uh, in doing his conquest in India. So Dionysus is off trying to conquer India. And, and so um, here comes Addis. He arrives, right? Um, and... Um, and so with all, of course, he's described uh, as a soft-skinned man and looks with shrill tones like the voice of a woman. So that is Addis, right? Uh, there's other parts of the story that goes into the fact that it says that he once had staying with a knife, the creative stock of marriage, consecrated youth, and threw away the burden of the plowshare without love or wedlock, the man's harvest offering. So he showed upon his two thighs the bloody dared and drops and made womanish his warm body with the shearing steel. Um, it's pretty detailed about descriptions of what he looked like afterwards. In fact, you go through all this, and they describe Addis in these writings as being a woman in form, uh, transformed, uh, long hair, uh, dress uh, in many ways. And it's interesting because in some cases, Addis, they'll use the feminine pronoun, and Addis will be a her. So the Greeks will go even a step further in that sense. I think that's interesting. So they'll still change that too. Okay, so there you have it. There are other stories too. But you know, you, you know, the Greeks are funny. They go, you know what? Everything has a natural order, a natural origin. So we think that maybe the story is a story of people that were mortals at one time. And so the story goes that once upon a time, it's <laughs> a human version of the story, um, a, a writer by the name of Diodorus writes that they're originally human beings. Kibli was exposed by uh, her parents, but somehow survives her fate and grows up and she falls in love with Addis and, and he gets her pregnant. Uh, it's like one of these stories, like, uh oh, Addis, what did you do? Uh, at this point, uh, the parents who abandoned Kibli recognize her and decide to take her back, uh, pregnant and all. But when they learn that Addis had impregnated her, they kill him. What you, 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 you killed, I mean, you, you impregnated my daughter? Suddenly, Kibli goes mad with grief. At this point, reveals that she really is a goddess. Uh, and that's that story. So there it is. So there's that fun story. Okay, now uh, moving right along. Addis is easily recognizable. Uh, he often wears a distinct Phrygian cap. This is a cap made of wool or soft leather and having a distinctive slight curl point at the top. By the way, another figure that has the Phrygian cap is King Midas. It's kind of throwing that one in uh, for fun. Uh, you have that. Um, and we're moving right along. That's where Agdestus, she is sometimes uh, shown as a god, sometimes as a goddess. She's uh, She seems to be in this realm in between. Uh, some people say the connector with Kibli Kabuba from Erkamish, uh, because you have uh, various images of Adronis, Adronis uh, deities, like, for example, the many breasted Zeus. So there you have it, right? But um, anyway, the leadership of the um, uh, of the Magnumator Phrygia are called the Archibaldi. We'll talk about that in a little bit. We also have two distinct priesthoods beneath our fraternities. One is called the Dendrophori. The Dendrophori are the tree bearers. 
and you have the conophori, which are the reed bearers. Those are the most important ones. The name Bali in itself now um, uh, is important. Uh, it is contested in ancient times. Some believe the name derived from the Gallus River in, in Phrygia, while Stephanus of Byzantium asserted the name came from a certain King Gali. But most likely, it comes from the Middle East. Uh, theories reveal uh, that the name derived most likely from the Sumerian word Gal, meaning great, and Lu, meaning man. So these are great men, and they were considered humans with magical powers or sexually ambivalent demons who were able to free the goddess Inanna from the underworld. Uh, in fact, in time, they, they were understood as the priests of Inanna. Uh, these are the ones uh, who would give voice to the lamentations of this goddess in much the same way as the Gali of Kibli were given uh, to the Lamentations of Attis. They, by the way, these, uh, these uh, uh, ancient Sumerian Gali, they do play the Tympanium. They carry ritual knives, which of course the Kibli Gali would also carry. According to Sumerian texts, the Gali were also depicted as having relations with men as females as females. So there you have. A popular theme uh, that we find of the Galu is that of meeting a lion while wandering about. An idea that we're going to see quite often in later sources, right? Uh, now, of course, you also have in Mesopotamia, other priests known as the Kalu, which also seems to have a connection to the Gala, and they were involved in the bull sacrifices, and they also played the companion. A third set of priests, the Mesopotamian, were known as the Asanu, and they were eunuch priests who also played in official liturgies, music, singing, dancing, and so they are also dedicated to Inanna. So it looks like that the Gali are a conflation of these three priesthoods, that gradually migrated towards the West. And where, and can we trace this migration? We actually can. Along the southern coast of Anatolia, uh, these, these kinds of distinctions with, with priests or priesthood is connected to the Luvians. The Luvians along the southern shore of Anatolia, uh, they had priests who also uh, did similar practices that were connected to cutting and bloodletting rituals, especially at the festival of Istanua, right? So uh, now not all of them would castrate themselves, but there is in evidence that many of them did indeed do self-castration. So you do have that, in a sense, that precedent uh, that connects there, right? Uh, so there you have it. So moving right along. Uh, according to uh, popular mythology at that time, Kibli was actually uh, a hermaphrodite, but castrated herself in order to become female with her severed genitalia transformed into an almond tree, according to some sources. Many scholars believe the male Gali were acting in a manner to ritually reverse this act, becoming female via their own castration. Perhaps with this in mind, most eunuch uh, the officiated mother goddess cults of Asia Minor also grew their hair long. They pierced their ears. They wore feminine clothing and jewelry. This display of femininity is even the case for the Gali, uh, who participated in the cult of Kibli, Asinius, which was then brought to Rome and even had a temple dedicated to her worship as early as 191 BCE. So there you have it. So, so Kibli uh, does have priests that transfer, transform into priestesses. Now we're going to go over a little bit because uh, I want to make sure uh, that we get all this information. If that's okay. <laughs> so, so let's take a look at some other parts here. 
The Greek anthology preserved some of the dedications connected to Bali of Ghibli. And, um, and so I want to go through some of these. Okay. So we have, uh, so here it is. Okay. So here are a few of them. Uh, one goes as follows. To thee, my mother Rhea, nurse of Phrygian lions, whose devotees tread the heights of Didymanus, did womanish Alexis, that's a name of this uh, a particular Gali, ceasing from furious clashing of the breasts, dedicate the stimulants of his madness, his shrill toned cymbals, the noise of his deep voice flute, to which the crooked horn of a younger steer gave a curved form, his echoing tambourines, his knife reddened with blood, and the yellow hair, which is once tossed on his shoulder, be kind, O queen, and give rest in his old age from his former wildness to him who went mad in his youth. This is a dedication uh, by a, a Gali who lived to be a nice older age, but who became a Gali in his youth when he was younger. And it shows his dedication. You're going to see often that towards the end of, of their lives, the Gali will present most likely before their death. I mean, obviously, uh, but sometimes right after in dedication to it, these offerings, which always include some or usually include a cuttings of their hair. Another dedication goes as follows. The long haired priest of Rhea. The newly gilded, the dancer from Lydian Tumults, whose shriek is heard afar, dedicates now, he rests from his frenzy, to solemn mother who dwells by the banks of the Sangris, his tambourines, his scourged arms with bones, these noisy brazen symbols, and a scented lock of hair. So there's another hair dedication uh, here. Uh, very, uh, another interesting votive of the Gali tells. Uh, about how they were saved from a lion due to their musical instruments or some other kind of, of version. A lot of scholars, I have five examples of this. A lot of scholars fight over this because here you can have a dedication story. And we have five extent that talk about the fact of a golly encountering a lion. There's a cave that's featured in it and they're saved. Uh, as a result. Now, you Jungian people, <laughs> this is something for you to interpret. I want you to listen closely because this is just raw materials uh, for you to work. So here we go. Okay. First goes as follows, right? Ready? The priest of Rhea, when taking shelter from the winter snowstorm, he enters the lonely cave, had just wiped the snow off his hair, when following on his footsteps came a lion devourer of cattle into the hollow way. But he with outspread hands beat the great uh, timbre he held and, and the whole cave rang with the sound, nor did that woodland beast dare to support the holy boon of Ghibli, but rushed straight up the forest clad hill in dread of the half girlish servant of the goddess who hath dedicated to her these robes and his yellow hair. So here you go, right? Right. So a lion is 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 uh, taken away, you know, through these instruments, flees. But here's a second one. A begging eunuch priest of Kibli was wandering through the upland forests of Ida, and there met with a huge lion, its hungry throat dreadfully gaping as though to devour him. Then, in fear of the death that faced him in its raving jaws, he beat his tambour. From the holy grove, the lion shut its murderous mouth, and as it itself, full of divine frenzy, began to toss and whirl its mane about its head, but he thus escaped a dreadful death dedicated to Rhea, the beast that had taught itself her dance. Okay, so there's a second one. Well, you're thinking, that's it? No, there's a third. Goaded by the fury of the dreadful goddess, tossing his locks in wild frenzy, clothed in women's raiment with well-plated tresses and a dainty netted hair call. A eunuch once took shelter in a mountain cavern driven by the numbing stone of Zeus. But behind him rushed 
an unshivering lion, slayer of owls, returning to his den in the evening, who looking on the man, snuffing in its shapely nostrils the smell of human flesh, stood still on his sturdy feet, but rolling his eyes, roared round loudly his greedy jaws. The cave, his den, thunders around him, and the wooded peak that mounts nigh to the clouds echoes loud. But the priest, startled by the deep voice, felt all his stirred spirit broken in his breast, yet he uttered from his lips the piercing shriek they use, and tossed his whirling locks, and holding up his great tambour, the revol revolving instrument of Olympian Rhea, he beat it, and it was the savior of his life. For the lion, hearing the unaccustomed hollow boom of the bull's hide, was afraid and took up, afraid and took up flight. See how all wise necessity taught a means to escape from death. We have two others. I'm not going to read them, but I want to tell you something. They're all the same. You know what I'm telling you guys, right? I am giving you the mysteries of Kimberly. You should have an aha moment right now. Oh, no. That's right. Right? You approach the cave. You have the instruments. You have the confrontation. You have the hurdle. You beat back the hurdle, right? Through your ways, because you are transformed as a result of the power of Kibli. And so the lion does you no harm. And you escape death. <laughs> they had five versions of this. This is part of the ritual they went through. Isn't that great? So we have the surviving aspects of this, this narrative. Uh, so, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a few interesting factors when it comes to some of these dedications. One talks about the, the knife of which the person opened their veins. And I just want to bring this up, that there is evidence that after making some of these dedications, uh, they commit suicide. Well, through, you know, at the end of your days as a golly, there's a ritual suicidal aspect to it. I find this in, in a few places. Uh, so there you have it. Okay, well, when Magna Mater entered the Greek world, she was equated with Aphrodite. Uh, since she had no mythology of her own, according to the Greeks. And they also transfer the Demeter belief system on her. So they saw her as a earth goddess, uh, as a Minoan equivalent of Gaia. They saw her as an exotic goddess, uh, uh, and they did display or show her a lion drawn chariot, crowned with the polos, depicting city gates and walls. Now, um, uh, we must remember that uh, uh, now the cult will spread to Athens, right, from Asia Minor. Uh, in fact, uh, by the 5th century, the sculptor Agorakritos fashioned a more Greek form of Kibli, which was established in the Agora of Athens for all to see. This Kibli was enthroned in a traditional sense with two lions on each side, but, of course, adding the tympanium, uh, in her, and of course, uh, and, uh, one arm and a drum in the other. Even though the tympani and the drum are connected to the Kibli cult via the, the Luvian aspects going back to the Middle East, uh, still the early iconography of Kibli does not include that. But it is the Greeks that bring the tympani and the drum into the actual imagery. Does that make sense? So we know that there's a connection in a ritualistic sense, but uh, it comes together uh, in imagery under the Greeks. So that's important to remember. And of course, uh, we also have um, the Tibetan custom uh, is connected to the cult of Kibli, uh, especially the idea of the ritual eating and drinking from its surface. Uh, Clement of Alexandria writes, he says, when I set forth the symbols, the sacred token phrases of initiation into these mysteries of Kibbele of Attis, to the advantage of my argument, I know that they will provoke laughter, even though you do not want to laugh at the exposure of your rights. I ate from the tympanion drum. I drank from the symbol. I carried the sacred dish. I went behind the curtain of the nuptial blood, unquote. According to Firmicus Maternus, uh, 
he says, in order to be admitted uh, into the temple of Kibbele, these words had to be cited. He says, here is a certain temple where in order to be admitted into the inner parts, a person says, I have eaten from the tympanion drum. I have drunk from the symbol. I have learned the secrets of religion. The act of drinking from a companion or symbol was a custom of the Hittites and especially the Luvians, who were prominent in southern Anatolia during the Bronze Age. In fact, the Hittite texts tell how the Luvian men of Lulapaya uh, drank from what was described as a dudupol, which is a close equivalent to a companion uh, during a ritual. One text states how the cupbearers filled the dudupol, who then gives it to the head of the men of the Lalapaya, who then, quote, sings opposite him like a woman in the same way, unquote. I know I'm, I'm digging deep into some of these mysteries. Are you seeing this? So you do have this precedent going back to the Luvians. I've done a lot of work with the Luvians. That's another lecture that I'd like to talk about uh, sometime. A claimant of Alexandria State mentioned symbols or sacred tokens uh, or phrases of initiation, inclusive of carrying what's called the kernos, which we could be described as carrying a vase. We know from the scolium of Alexander Farkin, I can't say that word three times, uh, uh, twice, uh, that the kernos of Phrygia contains lamps. So, the, so these are lamps uh, that are hidden within a vase. And they are brought out, much like, you know, uh, out of a cave, so to speak. And these are referenced often. There's also the mention of a nuptial, uh, in act, a, a nuptial action that seems to also connect to the inner nouns of a temple. So there is a nuptial um, kind of relation. And we're not fully sure what that means, unless you are, in a sense, being married uh, to Kibbele. Right, so there you have it. The cult was not so easily assimilated, uh, considered very barbarian in many ways. Uh, you have a certain Anarchus uh, who was a philosopher from Scythia, and he was initiated into the cult of Kibli, and as well as the Elysian Ministries. And when he returned home, his brothers slayed him for doing so. You know, uh, there is also uh, the problem uh, when it comes to. Uh, how Kibli was understood within the Greek world. There was a shocking display in 415 BCE where a man leaped on the altar of the 12 gods and castrated himself with a stone uh, to the horror of the Greeks uh, seeing this violence uh, going on. Uh, so, uh, but there you have it. So, so many, many ways the Greeks as well as the Romans wanted to keep some of these rituals into the margins as you can imagine, right? Um, you have, of course, um, uh, I, I could talk about uh, the Temple of Artemis. What I'm gonna do is I wanna get through the whole talk and I'll talk about the Temple of Artemis afterwards in my personal experience at Mount Pion. But I wanna kind of cap off uh, all the, uh, the, the various aspects of this before we continue. And then I'll go back if you want, and I'll talk about Artemis and Mount Pion and my experiences that I had there. Uh, because otherwise, uh, I want to make sure we get to other places, right? Okay, so now, uh, moving right along. So what happens? Here we go. So I'll make sure we have here. Is that this grief system will now be transferred to Rome. I want to make sure we get down uh, some of the holidays before we finish up. Uh, here we go. Uh, so what happens is that... Uh, the custom or the, uh, the belief system will eventually transfer over uh, to Rome. Actually, I want to mention a few things before I get there. Kind of going through my notes, um, but I want to make sure here. Okay, here we go. Uh, so I want to mention here that there is, the Greek literature refers to Kibbeli. There's quite, a, a, bit, uh, quite a, a, a lot to choose from. The earliest is the Homeric hymns from the sixth century. 
It says, to the mother of the gods, the mother of all gods and all human beings. Sing to me, clear tone muse, the daughter of great Zeus. The resounding of rattles and tympania and the roar of flutes please her and the clamor of wolves and flashing eyed lions, the echoing mountains and the wooded valleys, and thus rejoice you all goddesses who join together in song. So you can see here, uh, the use of Tapanium was now formally understood. It's still very much connected. The earliest reference to the priests of Kimberly, the Galilee and Greek sources are not too flattering. For the fourth century comic poet and Ethemis, those known as the Metragarites were dishonorable, while the torchbearers were honorable. For Greek writers as diverse as Antiphanes, Athenaeus, Aristotle, and Plutarch, the priests of Kibli were deemed as itinerant and rootless wanderers that often begged for support and often trafficked in con games to gain some support. The act of self-castration to become female-like in form and action often directly influenced their ability to find a job. They couldn't find a job. Interesting, right? Because by doing this, they were understood as socially unacceptable. So they were literally, in a sense, cut themselves off from society. So according to Athenaeus, as quoted by Athanasius, what kinds of jobs did they get? One job was that they could become a nurse. So many of these found an occupation, again, you're learning things that most people don't know about. They're wondering how in the world, after you go through a castration process in the very patriarchal, Greco Roman world, you're now a golly, but guess what? You can't all live in a temple. <laughs> You've got to do something for a living, right? And so what, what kinds of occupations did they have? And one is a nurse for children. Uh, they would gain the confidence of a local household. Uh, it's interesting because they were, used the word nurse in the feminine, not the masculine. So these golly were looked at as female nurses to look after your children, and they're considered very good at doing so. According to Lucian Samosata, uh, the great goddess of Syria, Artagardus, was related to Rhea and hence Kibli, and had Gali as well. Uh, Lucian tells us two stories of how the cult of, uh, were connected to eunuch priests. The first version was a Lydian priest of Kibli named Attis, uh, who is, actually his name was named is Attis Rhea. Isn't that interesting? So he had a name that was a hybrid masculine and feminine name who was castrated by the goddess. He arrives at Areopolis to teach his sacred rites and mysteries, uh, adding that he was not permitted to share his knowledge east of the Euphrates River. Uh, at Areopolis, this Attis builds a temple of Ghibli. Lucy reveals how the two goddesses were alike, Astrogartus and Ghibli in many ways inclusive of the mural crown, the two lions, and the tympanion, along, of course, with the Gali. In the second version of the story, it, it, the Gali were a result of the creation of a second temple uh, dedicated. Actually, the story goes, it's a long story, but here we go. I'll try to keep it really short here. Once upon a time, uh, a there was a dream by Stratonisi, who is the wife of the Syrian king, uh, to create a temple or rebuild the temple of Kibli. Uh, her husband, uh, of course, agreed with this, but he, she also had a close friend that would help with the construction of this temple. And fearing to be compromised with the wife of the king, as he helps rebuild the temple of Kibli, he castrates himself as a preventative measure, leaving his testicles in a sealed uh, envelope. <laughs> Pratanisi did indeed become attracted to uh, her friend, was insulted by his refusal, but when she heard what he did to resist her, 
she became his friend and companion. Okay. Lucian states how Gali are so often beloved by women. Women loved Gali in ancient times. Now, however, the king misunderstood their closeness as advanced upon his wife. He ordered him to be executed. Uh, but when this friend then revealed his testicles in the envelope, the king realized that he was honorable and uh, said he was a great fortune. And uh, as a result, the precedent happened that all of those who were priests of the mother goddess in that region were to be castrated. But here's the important part. It was also decreed that women, sorry, that the Gali were always to dress as women, according to Lucian, so that women would not mistake the Gali as men and seek to have relationships with them because for some reason, women love the Gali. <laughs> they, they, were, they were handsome. Uh, they, were, they were kind. They were sweet. <laughs> of course, they were also had no male member. But the point of the matter is they dressed as, as women so that they would be understood within society as women. There is so much to unpack here. Seriously, I could go forever, but I gave you that nugget that I unfortunately have to keep going. We can unpack that later if you want. Right. Okay, uh, moving right along. Okay, so what will happen is the Kibli cult will then be transferred over uh, to Rome. Uh, and uh, the story goes here it is uh, that uh, is that the uh, the Romans, if they were to be successful, according to the sublime oracle, had to have Kibli um, in Rome. And, and so uh, the Romans negotiated uh, with the Phrygians uh, through the, the Pergamum kings, who then transferred uh, the sacred meteorite stone uh, to the the, the Roman capital, uh, and it arrived. And when it arrived, when it got there, in the year 204 BC, it was supposed to be brought off the ship. They couldn't move the stone any further or the ship. <sighs> what are they going to do? Well, there's this Vestal Virgin, who many people claim that she had broken her vow of chastity. And she said, she said, you know what? Give me this chance to prove that I have been chased. And so what she did is she goes up to the prow of the ship. She unties her girdle. She wraps it around the very front part. And she, she her lo alone, is able to push the whole ship uh, onto the docking area, as well as the stone. And, of course, she is deemed as being pure at that point. Uh, and the stone uh, is then brought to Rome. And in year 191 BCE, a temple was already dedicated uh, to her on the Palatine Hill uh, near the Circus Maximus. And, uh, and uh, what happened is, is that uh, the, it's interesting because the temple stood here. Below it was a, a proscenium and like a stadium-like area to have the various mysteries. So it all could be contained within the temple precinct itself. And then right in the middle of this was the great high altar dedicated uh, to, to Kibbelin. Okay. But of course, uh, the Romans did everything they could uh, to restrict the worship from spreading too much outside of this holy precinct. Uh, There's a few places, uh, times that they, they could get out. But the Romans really wanted to keep the foreign influence uh, really, really trained. Uh, so, um, in fact, I have to say that the Gali oftentimes confused the Romans. Uh, I have here a quote from Marshall. It goes as follows. Uh, it says, uh, the, Gal the Gali says, what is a female slit to you, Bactius Gallus? Uh, and it goes on to talk about the fact that, and I don't want to read this because it's pretty interesting, but it goes on to say the fact that that uh, 
that they're neither viewed as men or women. In some cases, uh, it's expected that the Gali will perform as a woman acts upon the male member. So apparently there is some uh, sacred prostitution here, and there's other ev evidence of that. However, having said that, uh, they are still not expected to be, according to this, with women, you know, so never not to be. And that it also says that their mouths are that of a male. So again, the Romans are not sure what to do with the Gali, in which category to place them. Are they men? Are they women? Are they a third group in between? Are they a third sex? And that sometimes is brought up as well. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to close with talking about two, three things I want to do. I'm going to talk about quickly the two holidays. And then I'm going to end with a quote by a Gali and what happened to her and her experiences. You guys got it? So this is how we conclude. And then we're going to go into, I will talk about other things, including my experience at Mount Pion uh, and Ephesus. But here we go. Okay, so the first great festival commemorated the castration and death of Addis. It occurred between March 15th through March 25th, the Canaphore carried reeds and stalks to the temple together with the image of Attis. The nine days followed a penitence where devotees, they abstained from meat products, they didn't eat any bread or certain fruits. He certainly could not have a pomegranate <laughs> and no wine. There is one kind of beverage that you could have. And that was milk. In fact, you could have as much milk as you would like. Solistius refers to this ritual of drinking milk. And it is possible that this milk was consumed in the mysteries at what was, and it was poured within the tympanium. That when they drank from the tympanium, what they drank was happened to be milk, possibly with the addition of honey, as suggested by. Uh, other scholars, right? Most devotees also refrain from sexual activity, heightening the intensity of the revelry at the end. First momentous day was known as the day of blood. It was a culmination of the morning cycle. At a certain point during the day, the high priest gave a signal to his Bali, and they commenced this ecstatic dance, and they circumnavigated around this pine tree that represented Addis. Then they went into this frenzied state to the accompaniment of the clarinet and cymbals. And the Kali started to cut themselves all over with knives as they twirled around like whirling dervishes, right? Uh, in their dance of madness, uh, they consecrated blood and they sprayed this blood all over the tree and onto the altars. Some of them also beat their naked breasts with sharp pine cones, shedding still more blood. With the dance reaching a feverish pitch, the feeling of divine madness descended upon the crowd, already susceptible to suggestion, uh, because, well, you have the vigilant fasting, and prompting many to be encouraged to cross the sacred boundary and join the dancing with the priests. With the sensation of ecstasy, as they crossed over this boundary, they suddenly lost control, and they in turn started to cut themselves uh, with their blood being shed upon the pine tree. The pace of the music then got faster and faster, with the rhythm of the mother goddess now taking control, and around and around they went, faster and faster, creating the feeling of rising ecstasy, reaching towards a climax. At this point, the men, once simply spectators or worshipers from afar, took a piece of broken glass or flint and possessed by ritualistic magic, cut off their male members, transferring themselves into Bali. Well, whew. so this is what happened on that day. 
Uh, Lucian also describes the day of blood uh, related to uh, uh, in, in, in Syria, in Areopolis, showing their particular ritual in relation to this custom. Here, like in Rome, uh, in the midst of the frenzy of music and dance, many in the crowd became possessed by madness, throwing off their clothing and uttering a cry and entered a circle with the golly. And they, and of course, obviously they soared, they castrated themselves. After this, I don't know how they did this. After this, the newly castrated devotees would actually run through the city. All I can say is, ow, <laughs> carrying their severed genitals along. At a certain point, they would then throw their genitalia into a random house. If there happened to be a woman living there, the new goddess was to receive her garments and ornaments to mark out her new identity. Uh, so there you have it. Well, after this castration, I told you I'd go there, and here we are. Uh, when the music was over, they had nowhere else to go but to join the priesthood. Within the day, the lower part of their stomach was tattooed. And when the wound healed, a gold leaf was placed over the spot. From then on out, the new Gali wore the very feminine dress of a priestess. They grew their hair long and lived their life as a woman, but still residing within the confines of a temple or sacred precinct, or they went out and tried to live a life as a nurse or something else. But as the madness of celebrations continued, three days of sorrow and grief for Addis followed the castration ceremony. According to Julian, on the third day, the holy and effable harvest of Gaulus, the actual pine tree itself representing Addis was cut and then buried much in the same way as Kibli buried the body of Addis. An all night vigil followed the worshipers chanting, have faith, O believers, God is saved, and for us salvation will emerge from his suffering. On the day following, March 25th, commenced the Hilaria, the day of joy, where Addis was proclaimed as resurrected, and so fertility again returned to the world through the power of the Magna Mater. This is basically a spring fertility festival. The day was filled with music and dancing and feasting. Uh, and then, of course, there was a second holiday, which is a lot shorter. Eight days later, this is from April 4th to April 10th, uh, celebrating the arrival of the, the Black Sacred Stone to, uh, to Rome. Typically, worshipers would offer up dishes called moritim to the goddess, which was a rather flavorful mixture of teas and herbs. This was a time of pantomimes and theatrical performances and major chariot races. According to some scholars, at the climax of this celebration, a bull was castrated, sacrificed, and the new initiates of the great mother were baptized in its blood. This ritual was called the Tarabolium. At first, the bull was simply sacrificed for its perceived potent powers. Uh, but eventually, uh, it was believed to give uh, life. Uh, if you bathe in the body, it purified you for eternity, or at least for 20 years, after which time it was ritually repeated. Uh, and so we have, of course, Prudentius talks about uh, in detail uh, about this, this uh, particular uh, part of the mystery rites. And there you have it. Okay. So we covered that, covered quite a bit. The last thing I want to talk about, and then we'll conclude, and then I'll talk about Ephesus. The last thing is an experience of a person who entered the rites of a family. Okay, and so I'm going to go ahead and read this story and go through it. And so it is written in the first century BCE by the Latin poet Catullus. And Catullus, this says, this basically sums up how it would be like 
to be a Gali and to have their experience. So here it goes. It is long. It is where I conclude. But it does give you so much insight. And I want to read this to you. It does also go into, uh, kind of connects with also ideas of third sex, as well as uh, transgenderism, and these ideas within the ancient world. So it is a rich text. It goes as follows. Carried in a fast ship over profound seas, Attis, eager and hurried, reaches the Phrygian grove. The goddess's dark places crowned with woodland, and there, exalted by amorous rage, his mind gone, he cuts off his testicles with a short flint. She, feminine gender, she then, aware of her limbs without the man, while the ground was still spotted with fresh blood, quickly took in her snowy hands a tambourine, such as serves your initiates, Kibli, instead of a trumpet. And shaking the hollow calf hide with delicate fingers, quivering, she began to sing to the troop thus. Go together, wandering herd of the lady of Dindimus, quick into exile. You looked for foreign places, and following me and the rule I had adopted, you bore with the salt tide and the violence of the high sea and emasculated your bodies from too much hatred of Venus. Interesting, emasculate your body, bodies from too much hatred of Venus. So already here you see the idea that uh, uh, it is, is viewed that the Gali is shunning love or at least the relationship with women, in many cases. Delight the lady's mind with your errant haste. Overcome your reluctance together. Go to the Phrygian shrine of Kibli, to her groves, where the voice of cymbal sounds, the tambourines rattle, where the Phrygian piper sings with a deep curved pipe, where maenades wearing ivy throw back their heads, where they practice the sacred rites with sharp yells, where they flutter around the goddess's cohort. It is there we must go with our rapid dances. Then he finishes saying that. As Athis, the counterfeit woman, sang this to her companions, the choir howled suddenly with tumultuous tongues. The tambourines, the cymbals clash again. The swift troops move off to Ida with hurrying feet, crazy, panting, drifting at her last gasp. Attis, with her tambourine, leads them through opaque groves like an underbroken heifer refusing the yoke. The swift votaresses follow their swift-footed leader when they reach Kibli's shrine, feeble and worn from too much toil. They take their rest without bread. Sleep covers their eyes with a heavy blanket. Their rapid madness subsides to a girlish quiet. But when the golden sun, with his streaming eyes, purified the white sky, hard land, wild sea, and drove away the shadows of the night with his thundering horses, Attis was roused, and sleep went quickly from her, back to the trembling arms of the goddess Pasathia, then from her girlish quiet, with no hurry madness, Addis remembered what she had done, listen closely, and saw in her lucid mind what was missing and where she was. Tempestuously, she turned back to the shore, there looking at the open sea with tearful eyes, with grief in her voice, she addressed her native land. Land which begot me, land which brought me forth, I am abject to abandon you like a runaway slave. My feet have carried me to the groves of Ida, to be among snow in the cold lairs of wild beasts. 
I shall vi visit their violent haunts. Where, O oh my land, can I imagine you are? My eyes desire you and narrows as it turns towards you. In this short interval when my mind is unfrenzied, shall I be carried away to forests from far away home, away from country, goods, friends, family, from the forum, palestria, race course, and gymnasium? There is nothing for me but misery. What shape is there that I have not had? A woman now, I have been a man, youth, and boy. I was an athlete, the wrestler. There were crowds around my door. My fans slept on my doorstep. There were flowers all over the house. When I left my bed at sunrise, shall I be waiting made to the gods, the slave of Kibli, I a manate, I a part of myself, I impotent? Shall I live above the snow line on green Ida? Shall I pass my life under the rocky peaks of Phrygia, where the doe runs in the woods, where the boar mooches in the glade? I regret now, now what I have done, I repent of it now. As these words hurried away from her pink lips, bringing a new message to the ears of the gods, Kibbele letting her lions off the leash and urging her forward, the beast on the left hand said, get on, be fierce and see what he's driven mad. And then of course she is made and saying again, and of course she is then, please, please into the Mount of Ida and into her new home. You have learned so much about the cult of Kibli. You have learned so much about the nature of the Gali. And so much of it you have heard directly from the primary sources. If anybody comes up to you and asks, how do you know? You don't have to say that James Rietveld told you. You can say those from the ancient world gave their say. And now you understand some of those mysteries. Thank you so much. All right. A lot of material. And I didn't even cover any of it. <laughs> so much more. <laughs> but, uh, I figure uh, it's, a, it's a good introduction. Any questions? Or, or maybe I should, should I tell you my Ephesus story or not? I don't know. I don't know. I think you should. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, briefly. Okay. So when it comes to the temple, okay. So in Ephesus, Artemis of the Ephesians is a hybrid between the goddess Kibbele and the Phrygian mountain mother. Uh, sorry, the Bridge about Mother, as well as uh, Artemis of the Moon and Hut. So she is a combination. She also has aspects of Hecate and other things. So basically, a long time ago, in Ephesus, uh, there was a site dedicated to Kibli, the great mountain mother, known as Mount Pion. Nearby, there was a temple dedicated to Kibli by a holy spring. Remember I told you Kibli connects with springs as well as mountains. And at this holy spring, there was a sanctuary dedicated to Kibli. Archaeological investigations have revealed uh, uh, it's definitely Kibli pointed with lions on it. Images of Kibli, uh, even priestesses of Kibli on the site that would eventually become the Temple of Artemis of the Ephesians. Well, what happens is the Temple of Artemis, uh, let's just say, sorry, the, the, the um, site uh, uh, of the Kibli Temple, you're going to have new arrivals coming from Greece, and they will build next to the Temple of Kibli, a temple dedicated to Artemis, goddess of the moon and hunt. And so these temples we find in the material culture existed at the same time next to one another. There is a king, Croesus of Lydia, who 
tearing down both of these temples, built one temple on top, and that temple then combined the two, go two goddesses, the goddess of the moon and hunt of the Greeks, and the, the Greek mountain mother, uh, Kibli, sorry, 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 the Anatolian mountain mother, Kibli, and made them as one. I'm sorry, my brain's going over the place here. So basically, I'll say it again. Iron. Okay, so you basically have now the Greek uh, uh, goddess of the moon and hunt, Artemis, worship now mixed by way of one combined temple with the Anatolian goddess Kibble. And so that worship going on. But nearby on Mount Pion, that, that transformation did not take place. It was still worshipped uh, as a place that was filled with the energy of Kibble. Well, what happened is that the Ephesians decided to make a road to the location of Ephesus from the Temple of Artemis to the city of Ephesus. And Mount Pion was located in between the Temple of Artemis on one side and the city of the Ephesians on the other side. The Mount Pion dedicated to Kibli, the mountain mother, was in between both those locations. And they made a what's called a Via Sacra, a sacred road. And this sacred road went around Mount Pion, from the Temple of Artemis, around Mount Pion, to the city of Ephesus on the other side. In a sense, lassoing it and including it within its power. They also set along this road a whole bunch of altars so that when the processions went from the Temple of Artemis to the city of Ephesus and looped around, circumnavigated around Mount Pion, uh, the worship would be inclusive of this mother goddess. You guys got it. So that was part of the local worship. But I got to tell you, also, before all this, you had an ancient graveyard that was also at the perimeter around Mount Pion. And so this was also believed to be a road of the dead. And that's, that cemetery continued into the 4th and 5th centuries. So when they did these practices, they also realize that this is a liminal space between the realm of life and the realm of death. So they worshiped another goddess here known as Hecate. And so Hecate was worshiped at this spot, but she was known as Artemis Hecate in association with Kibble. And so we have a hybrid goddess that has three different aspects. So if you go on Mount Pion, you have, you have these niches that are cut right into the stone where they put votive offerings to Kibli in there. You also had places where they would worship Hikate along the same hillside. And, uh, and so it's all of this combined together. I think that's really fascinating. So what I did is that um, I spent a lot of time in Ephesus. If you add up all the time in Ephesus, it probably adds up to about maybe seven months. And so I literally spent a lot of time around Mount Pion. One time uh, I was exploring Mount Pion and I'm going around the Tomb of the Seven Sleepers and I noticed that there was a cave. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, you don't hear about this cave very often. Archaeologists know about it, but tourists don't know about it until now. And you go through this cave, and you turn around on the side, and opens up, and turns out the center of Mount Pion is hollow and has a grove, an ancient grove that grows there, vegetation. There's water trickling, and it's set uh, almost like a crater of a volcano, even though it's not a crater. It's set right in there. So you, you're, in a sense, you, you go through the cave, and suddenly you're in sunlight. 
and you're surrounded by this this grove, this this little forest that's in the center of the hill. And this was the sacred center dedicated to Kibble. And so uh, in a sense, you go through the cave uh, and on the other side, there is the light and there is a this, this, this strange sensibility about it. Because when I went there, uh, I felt like this strange enchanting presence as if I was not alone, as if I was being watched. And it really did feel like I had entered sacred ground and I was the only one there. Of course, me being me, I quickly brought others to view this, this place, this grove in the middle, middle of Mount Pion. Uh, and it's certainly a feast for the eyes. So if you ever go with me back to Ephesus, I will take you there uh, to the center, to the heart of Mount Pion, where inscriptions say they worship the great Phrygian Mountain Mother, and you too can have this experience. Anyway, that's my story. Okay, <laughs> any questions? No questions? Did I answer all the questions? I had a question. Okay. Is there any suggestion that there was a use of like psychedelic drugs during these rituals where they the young men go mad and castrate themselves? I mean, it's very extreme, this whole cult. It, you think it's very extreme? What? <laughs> this? <laughs> What's extreme about it? <laughs> well, Here's a, here's, a, here's a factor. They, they fasted for so many days. They were pretty hungry. So many of you know that if you fast for many days, in many cases, they had all-night vigils. So if you don't eat, you don't sleep, you know, I guess you get a little milk, <laughs> but that's about it. Uh, you're going to be already on the edge of something. And so one wonders why they didn't just simply collapse, but I think they were under this adrenaline rush. But you would think that there would be some kind of pharmaceuticals involved uh, in this, this process. I mean, for example, when Lucian talks about somebody doing this headstrong act and then running after this. Yeah. I don't know if I can imagine that. And the other part is, is that since it looks like, because you guys heard for yourself, the references to it all being removed, right? You saw that there, there's nothing left according to the sources. There's a few that said that, that there's a few that mentioned just testicles, but most of them is it's all, of, you know, that's a lot of bleeding. That's a lot of pain. So I, you could, you think they'd have to have something to be able to put up with that, that much pain? But I'll be honest, I haven't found anything. Really? And people would see this act as something that proves that Kibley is in control. So, you know, unlike the Illusion Mysteries, where Ergot, right, <laughs> you know, probably had a little bit of something going on. Uh, the idea is, is that you it had to be self castration. It couldn't be, uh, it couldn't be anybody else doing that, and so you are the one that has to do it, and you have to build up to a certain frenzied state to reach this point. So it is possible that maybe they didn't use any drugs at all. And all I can say is, ouch, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? I had a professor in college tell me that um, there, there were mushrooms, uh, psychedelic mushrooms that some of the, the cults used that, as part yes. of the mysteries. Yes, and they were, there were. Is this quite one a bit. of them? No. No? Yeah, this is not, this, ah. the, the Illusion Mysteries is one of them. Yeah. But this one doesn't seem to be. Uh, there's di in a Dionysian, you know, the wine, intoxication. Mm -hmm. I know. And, and I think this is where we go into 
another kind of topic where the person who is involved has to really want to do this as opposed to just being lost in the moment. And many scholars have looked into this, that this is an intentional decision to leave behind male society. This is, a, this is they want this. They don't, they don't identify with maleness. They identify with femaleness. And so they, in a sense, will now live as a female and they made this decision, no matter how painful it is, because there's got to be some other motive beyond just simply religious devotion, right? And or being lost in the moment to give that that you know, even though the the, the divine madness is there, um, supposedly, uh, it is still a, still viewed as uh, we. I, I, did, I skipped the quote. Uh, it was expected for. Uh, also, the, the Gali to speak with a female voice, so they could no longer speak like a man. They had to learn how to talk like a woman. They had to learn, according to another source, to move like a woman. In fact, I think I read part of that already, the, the movements of a woman. They had to grow their hair long like a woman. Uh, they had to dress, of course, as a woman. Uh, they had to they basically entered into female life. And as you saw from this long, very long uh, poem, you even took on, and the inscriptions too, you even took on the gender terms of a female, sometimes took on a female name and took on the female pronoun. And so you became a she. So this is oftentimes uh, mentioned as evidence of transger, transgenderism within ancient times. You know, this is, this is, there it is. You know, this is, uh, this, there, and, and there's, this is not the only one from Roman times. You have, you have a famous Roman by the name of Eli Gabos. He's an emperor who wanted to become a woman and wanted to have operation to, to undo his madness. So, I mean, this is not the only case. We have other situations. And so that was a Roman emperor during the 200s. So, I mean, it's interesting. And by the way, his, his worship uh, was connected to the Syrian goddess, which has connections to the Phrygian goddess. So, so there you have that too. There's another connection. So it does look like that this act was done uh, as an early form. And, and there's another source um, the, from the fourth century that mentions the fact that uh, the, they were no longer male or female. They were a third. Uh, which means a third group. And that could be referring to uh, a third gender. Thank you, Thomas, for being here. Uh, a third gender. And of course, we come across the idea of a third gender uh, throughout the world. We come across it in, uh, um, we, we find it in India, right? We find this in Thailand. We find this in the indigenous peoples of the Americas, in the two spirits, right? You find this in, in Mesoamerica. Uh, you find this amongst the Igbo and various groups in Sub-Saharan Africa. You find this in the Qin Dynasty, you know, in, in China, you find this. I mean, seriously, it's, it's almost more of a rule than an exception in ancient times. In fact, even uh, they discovered recently uh, during the Iron Age in Persia around the, the, the eight, nine hundreds, they find burial places for men, women, and for those who are neither. And, and the burials uh, have have both uh, female as well as male aspects, but they're, we take a look at their, their bodies and their skeletal remains are male, but they still retain the female dress. So, yeah, so this is probably just another example, the Bali are another example of this phenomenon in ancient Roman times. I think it's interesting that they that, uh, these, these Bali that didn't have to be stuck in a temple or they want to be in a temple, I guess many of them is idealistically you go, you do your conversion, and you're going to be in the temple precinct. But apparently, it doesn't always happen, and you got to go out and do something for a living. So, uh, a lot of these became nurses uh, for families, and uh, they were viewed as gendered as female. Uh, so, just like any female nurse that you get from the fa uh, family, you would just get a. Um, and and then I have to tell you, there was an advantage to that. You guys figured out the advantage yet? 
to have a, because what happened is, is that because the Greeks and Romans viewed uh, many of the Gali as neither, um, if you have the master's wife bringing in a nurse who is, is, is not a female, but is a female, may all, because many times many of the Greek men uh, and Roman men would do their thing with the nurse. I mean, very vague. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And this would certify against that kind of thing happening. Just throwing that one out. And it's not just made up either. Does that make sense? So there's this kind of security there. It's like, well, and, and, and the funny, the other interesting thing is funny in a good way is that these Gali were known in Roman times as women love them. <laughs> you know, it's like, hey, you know, like, you'll love being with them. These they're and to the point where, you know, you better dress up as a female because women were attracted to these men uh, who had gone through the castration. As also mentioned in the primary sources, and of course, you know, had no testosterone. And because many of them did this very young in age, many of them were beardless or had very sparse beards. And of course, they shaved. Many of them. Uh, because of lack of testosterone, started to develop female characteristics. And they talked about this in the primary sources, that their hands were soft. I think I read one of those right there, right? Uh, and their hands were soft, their skin was soft. They, in many cases, developed breasts. If you know your biology, that sometimes happens. This is interesting. So you're learning too much. <laughs> there you have it. So, uh, so the golly do kind of fit in with this category that you see throughout the world, even at that time, right? The Indian third, third uh, sex goes back to at least 1,500 BCE, you know? And we know the Thai uh, traditions goes back at least to the first century BCE. So yeah, these ideas are out there. Mesoamerica, of course, uh, back to uh, about at least 2,500 years. So am I answering your questions? All right. Any other questions? Anything that jumped out at you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I gotta say this, huh? She just seems to be sort of a harsh goddess that even after, you know, they've castrated themselves and devoted themselves to her and, and maybe they got to stay in the temple and maybe they didn't, then at the end of their lives, they have to cut off their hair and kill themselves. Well, they cut off their hair. And in some cases, it looks like they, 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 they did a ritual suicide. Not in all cases, but, but we know for sure in some, you know, yeah. you know, so, that so, you know, because they dedicate the, the, the knife at, he did the action with, so I guess they're doing something. Yeah, I know it's, but um, you know, it is. It, it's an interesting world. But remember, you got to remember, she is a wild goddess, and so this so. is the this is the price to pay, right? The price to pay for peace in nature is you have to retain that threshold, wild realm in between. Right, so that's that's part of the agreement. You got to respect her uh, as she is. Now, I got to I got to tell you that um, the the Phrygian cult, the ecstatic cult, that happened in this region, the sense of ecstasy. Remember, in the Phrygian cult, uh, you know they would spin around as they go into this ecstasy, and you know with with pipe music, you know the flute music going on, and the, the, the you know obviously the tambourine and the drum, right? They go into this ecstasy. It's interesting from because later on, from that same region, the exact same geographical location in Anatolia, in Phrygia, same area, same exact towns, there was a form of ecstatic form of Christianity called Montanism, where women were in charge, basically. They were women, and they practiced an ecstatic religion with the flute and the lyre and they spun around and they danced and they sung and uh, it was mystical and ecstatic and wild. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and uh, so then in that same region, uh, you have a guy by the name of Rumi. 
<laughs> you guys ever heard of whirling dervishes? The same region. And guess what they're doing? They're doing the ecstasy and they're doing the spinning and they're doing the song of the hey, the flute. Hey, look, <laughs> the flute music in all three of them, the whirling dances in all three of them, the ecstatic dancing in all three of them, the, the mystical transformation, all three of them. Isn't it interesting? And of course, the early form, you read early writings connected to Rumi, women were as much as the, a part of the belief system as men early on. And that just changed more patriarchal after that, but during that time, Women as well as men were part of this belief system, and they were dancing in the streets uh, and whirling around. Uh, in fact, everybody was claiming Rumi. The pagans in the town, the Christians in the town, the Muslims in the town, they're all claiming him. And in many ways, it was still another ecstatic cult. I, I find it fascinating that, that there's so many similarities with these movements. So in a sense, the, the frenzied, unbridled energy of Kibbele will continue uh, in the center heart of Anatolia, uh, even through the time of Rumi. And of course, uh, give expression to uh, three forms of ecstatic uh, expression, one pagan, one Christian, and one Muslim. Cool. <laughs> oh, more, more mysteries. Is this fun? Right? So. Of course, I visit these regions. By the way, to this day, there are three villages in, in, in Turkey that still do the ancient circular dance that goes back to the pagan era that you can visit. They're still doing the, the spinning dance. That's not, not, the, not the Muslim one, not the Christian one, but the pagan one. So there are remnants. All right, any, any, any other any questions? So slightly controversial, I don't know. <laughs> um, how, can the, how can the truth be controversial? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't I don't I don't necessarily recommend an ex, you know, if you're a pagan reconstructionist. I'm not, not sure if you exactly want to do this one. <laughs> well, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's like I through the form. <laughs> Yeah, we lose people quickly, like, oh, no, you know, through the form. You know, next week, you know, we'll, we'll meet a new golly saying, Dr. Riefeld, you know, has changed my life. It's like, great. But when it comes to the history of, of, of transgenderism, uh, it, it tells you, you know, that there are many people who had felt this way, who had wanted to become female. And even though they were isolated as a result of it, felt it was worth worth the risk. I mean, think about the risk. First one is you could die by doing this. I mean, death is very real. And I wonder how many of these golly died mm -hmm. right away of infection. I mean, it's not like this is the modern world, but they would do everything, anything to be able to uh, assert that their identity is female. And so in that case, uh, they are brave pioneers mm -hmm. uh, to a movement that still today uh, seems to be controversial. And even, just like in Greek and Roman times, people seek to put those who have these views into special places. You know, and those in Rome, they could only leave the precinct, you know, what, during two holidays during the year. And then they had to stay kind of cooped up in their, where they're at. Or everywhere else, they, you know, they, they could, fortunately, were forced to jobs, um, nurse, and unfortunately, the other one is prostitution. I'm sorry, they were forced into these kinds of jobs because they were not accepted. And, and this is, seems to be the case so often when it comes to uh, transgender today mm -hmm. in, in those cases too. And so, it tells you that things need to change, you know, yeah. and needed to change them as well. But uh, we have places like India and Thailand with the third sex, but, you know, but so much of our legacy comes from the Greeks and the Romans and putting aside uh, these people in a special place. However, 
uh, to, to turn a little upswing, they did have the protection of Kibbele and they were considered sacred. So within that context, at least if they survived and stayed in the temple, um, they were considered very holy. So, I don't know if I'm sure there's a mixed blessing or not. Ah, any final thoughts? No. All right. Well, I guess guess we'll close it up. Did you, right. you guys learn a lot? Learned a yeah. lot. You, you talked for a long time. It's uh oh, I don't have a clock here, but like, yeah, this is one of your longest lectures. It I is. Think. Got it. Yep. So, yeah. yep. And it didn't even cover it, hardly any of it. <laughs> That's the surface. All right. Well, thank you so much. Good. And, um, and have and, any questions? No, no last questions? No, no last rights? <laughs> thank you so much and have a great evening.